of Revelation dealing with a woman who rides on a scarlet colored beast with seven heads and ten horns. The great harlot is our subject tonight. We're only going to take the first six verses and um, next week we'll go into it in even more detail. But let's take the first six verses of chapter 17, Lord willing, tonight. Verse 1. There came one of the seven angels who had the seven vials or bowls of wrath. Those were the seven last plagues. And talked with me, saying unto me, Come here, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore, or harlot, that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Let's take a brief moment to ask the Lord to speak to our hearts. Father, as we go through this text, I pray, Father, that you'll guide us by your spirit and that what is said would truly be what you want us to understand. Help us to be careful, Lord, with the word of God, that we might truly reflect uh, its message. For it is one interpretation, the one you want. And help us, Lord, in all of our evaluation of these matters that seem so mysterious to us. God, may we use your word to guide us. Scripture compared with Scripture. And thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. The great harlot. In verse 1, we have the announcement of her judgment. If you'll look back, please, in chapter 16 and verse 19, we have a statement in the seventh plague the seventh bowl that the angel poured out, we have this statement. The great city was divided into three parts. The cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Go back to chapter 14, please. Chapter 14, verse 8, also announced this coming judgment. There followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Go to chapter 18, following our discussion here tonight. In verse 2, it has an angel crying out with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies, and so forth. Chapter 19, we hear a great praise gathering in heaven, all heaven singing the praises of our Lord. And in verse 2 it says, True and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore, or harlot, who did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. So it's a very, very important issue that we have in Revelation, the mystery surrounding this Babylon the Great, this woman described as a great harlot a sitting upon the beast with seven heads and ten horns. So the announcement of judgment 
um, is right there in verse 1. He talked with me and said, come here, I'll show thee the judgment. What we're talking about is the woman being judged that sits upon many waters. Now, friends, I believe that chapter 17 and 18 are the same thing. Uh, that isolates me somewhat uh, because there are many fine Bible teachers, including the ones that I studied under, who believe that chapter 17 is religious Babylon and chapter 18 is political Babylon. I do not believe that, and I will be telling you reasons why a little bit later. But I believe that these are um, descriptions of one thing, God's judgment upon the great harlot. And I believe Babylon the Great is not uh, political and religious. I believe it's the same thing. Whatever this harlot means, that's what it is in both chapter 17 and 18. So 18 should be looked at in the context of whatever 17 means. 18 is just giving further details about how this woman has corrupted all nations of the earth. All kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And that also will affect naturally our viewpoint of what in the world it's talking about. Now let's take a look at the authority of the woman in the opening few verses. And I'd point out two things. One would be the position that she has. Verse 1 says she sits upon many waters. But she also sits on the scarlet colored beast according to verse 3. Now, we haven't yet broken down what the beast is with seven heads and ten horns, but we have already suggested a possibility, and that is that they represent world empires. If that's so, then this woman has been affecting all world empires. Uh, we do know that the coming Antichrist, who will be the eighth world empire, comes out of the seventh, which is a confederation of ten divisions a world empire with ten divisions. And out of that comes the Antichrist, who in and of himself becomes the eighth. That is discussed here in chapter 17, and we'll be looking at that in detail in our next time together. But the position that she has is very interesting to me. She's sitting upon many waters. Look at verse 15. He saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore or the harlot sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. A fourfold description of planet Earth. Uh, we know that God is bringing out of all of these uh, peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues a people for himself. But this woman has had such incredible in influence uh, and authority that she's sitting on all of these nations. So if your view of this woman does not encompass all nations, all peoples, all languages, you have the wrong view. Uh, not only do I see her authority in the position that she has, but I see it in terms of the people that she influences. In verse 2 it says, With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. There's often an emphasis upon the kings. Go back to chapter 14 again and look at verse 8. Chapter 14, verse 8 that we read a moment ago speaks about Babylon falling, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. She made all nations. Once again, whatever your view is, it affects all nations of the world. Look at chapter 18, verse 3. Again, all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the kings of the earth, the emphasis on the leaders, have committed fornication. Also, the merchants have grown rich, uh, rich over her, and there's a lot of other things. Uh, verse 9 mentions the kings of the earth again. Uh, they're going to be in great uh, wailing and mourning, as verse 10 says, because Babylon, that mighty city, has fallen in one hour uh, the judgment has come. And the whole world is going to weep. Verse uh, 16, alas, alas, that great city. Uh, verse 17, in one hour so great riches are come to nothing. Verse 18, they saw the smoke of her burning and said, what city is like unto this great city? 
Verse 19, alas, alas, that great city in which were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness, for in one hour is she made desolate. In chapter 19 and verse 2, it says, He has judged the great whore who did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. Now what we have here is a woman who has affected all nations, the kings of the earth, all economic systems of the world. Uh, everybody who's been on planet earth has been affected by this woman. That is an incredible a statement um, in trying to decide who it is. You have to stick with Bible details. And I always prefer to, to lay out the scenario. Let's look at what the Bible says before we jump to conclusions because our evaluation may be a little bit short-sighted if we don't have all the facts and details in front of us. Now, in addition to the announcement of judgment in verse 1 and the authority of the woman presented in the opening three verses, verse 4 tells us about the appearance of this woman. And really three things are mentioned. I want you to look at them carefully. Three things about the appearance of this woman called Mystery Babylon the Great. First, the apparel of the woman. We are told in uh, verse 4 that she was arrayed in purple and scarlet color. Now, there's a lot of things that we could say about that. One is it certainly pictures royalty. Uh, this woman is not an insig insignificant player in terms of history. Uh, the woman is very, very um, noble in character or wealthy in character or demonstrating royalty and majesty. I could not help, in thinking of this woman, contrasting her with the godly woman. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. It's very interesting uh, how women are used to picture religion in the Bible. For instance, uh, the church is the wife, the bride of the Lord Jesus. Uh, Israel is the wife of Jehovah. We also have that woman Jezebel picturing the corruption uh, of those who are involved in sinful actions. And we also have the woman clothed with the sun and the moon and the 12 stars in chapter 12 picturing Israel. And now we have a, a, a woman who's described as the great prostitute, the great whore, the great harlot who, who has been um, affecting all nations of the world. So women are often used in the Bible to picture religion. And the apparel of this woman, this religious system, whatever it is, is certainly wealthy to say the least. It has a picture of nobility and of majesty and glory. But when you look at the godly woman, what a contrast. 1 Timothy 2, 9. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. Uh, quite a contrast. With shamefacedness uh, and sobriety. Uh, not with uh, broided or braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. So back to Revelation, uh, she's the opposite of God's standard of godliness in, woman, in women. She is on display. There's no doubt about it. Uh, she is arrayed with a lot of lavish colors and expensive material. Uh, secondly, in addition to the apparel, look at the adornment of the woman. The adornment. It says in verse 4 that she's decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Once again, we just read the opposite. It's just interesting to me. The words are even the opposite of the godly woman in 1 Timothy 2, 9. Um, turn to 1 Peter 3. You have somewhat the same thing there. In 1 Peter 3, 3, it's almost as though the scriptures are showing you a direct contrast between the godly woman that God honors in the Bible and this harlot. They're just totally the opposite. This woman is bedecked with uh, gold, precious stones, and pearls. Yet 1 Peter 3, 3 says of the godly woman, whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of braiding the hair and of wearing of gold or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. So the very adornment of the woman is in total contrast 
to everything God says about the godly woman. Look in chapter 18 of Revelation, verse 16. In chapter 18, verse 16, it reminds us of this fact again. It says, alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Now, right away, some of you are already thinking about the possibilities. We have somebody who has affected all nations of the world, who has quite a position of authority in the world and influence, and has a lot of wealth. Um, I think it's safe to say that we rule out Calvary chapels. And it's interesting, as you go down through the religious systems of the world, religion has often been known for its wealth. And in particular, one church has been known for its wealth. Currently, that church remains as the wealthiest church in the world. No one's even close. Not only in property, but in possessions. The treasuries of that church alone which are open to the public for tours, I've been there, are absolutely incredible. And when one goes down this list, the possibilities are narrowing. The apparel, the adornment, makes you wonder. Let's go back to chapter 17, look at the third thing in verse 4 about the appearance of the woman. Not only her apparel and her adornment with all these uh, precious stones, pearls, and gold, but the abominations of this woman are brought to our attentions. It says, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Wow. A golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 51. Jeremiah chapter 51. In Jeremiah 51, verse 6 to 8, we have this instruction. Flee out of the midst of Babylon and deliver every man his soul. Be not cut off in her iniquity, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will render unto her a recompense. Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand. Now, back at the time of Jeremiah, uh, he's talking about Babylon coming in to destroy Judah. Babylon is at its height and its power. And this woman is called Mystery Babylon the Great, mother of harlots. And abominations. And the golden cup is full of abominations, God says. And here in uh, Jeremiah 51 8, it says, Babylon, uh, 51 7, Babylon has been a golden cup in the Lord's hand. Now, watch this that made all the earth drunk. The nations have drunk of her wine. Therefore, the nations are mad. Babylon has suddenly fallen and destroyed. Um, it says, howl or wail for her, take balm for her pain, if so be she may be healed. I, I, I think it should be obvious to many of you reading this that these passages referring to ancient Babylon and its coming destruction, which happened under the Medo-Persian Empire, uh, is also quoted in Revelation of this woman who's described as Babylon the Great. So one of the first things that you must understand in interpreting Revelation 17 and 18 is that you cannot do so without connecting it with ancient Babylon. Uh, this is a very, very important point. Whatever Babylon was, all the things that God said about it long ago are being quoted in Revelation 17 and 18 about this woman in the end time who has been sitting on all the nations of the world. So it's a very, very critical uh, uh, argument concerning who is this woman. Now go back to 1 Kings chapter 14. 1 Kings chapter 14. And look at verse 22. 1 Kings 14 verse 22. 
It says, Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins which they had committed above all that their fathers had done. For they also built them high places and images and groves or idols on every high hill and under every green tree. And there were also sodomites in the land. People say, well, who are the sodomites? We're talking about sexual perversion. It was always primarily homosexuals. And they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. Now remember this woman is seen with a golden cup. And remember Babylon is a golden cup in the hand of the Lord. But it's full. What's inside of it, the wine in it, is the wine of her fornication. It's full of abominations. Uh, full of sexual perversion and idolatry. Boy, makes you wonder who the woman is in the light of what's going on in our country. Second Kings, please, chapter 21. Second Kings, chapter 21. Concerning Manasseh, and by the way, because of the sins of this man, God brought the judgment of Babylon upon Judah. Even though he repented at the end of his life, God still brought it. Verse 2 of 2 Kings 21, it says, He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, watch this, after the abominations of the heathen, or the nations, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. Throughout the Bible, you see the connection of abominations that have come into Israel and Judah as coming from nations that the Lord has cast out. And so the influence is coming outside and in, and they are a adopting and adapting to it. Verse 9, they hearken not, and Manasseh seduced them to do more evil than did the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel. Uh, her abominations are called seducing. It's like, here, take a drink. And you take a drink, and you're all of a sudden drunk, the Bible says, with her fornication uh, her sexual uh, solicitation and seduction that leads you into all kinds of idolatry and sin. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel chapter 20. Isn't this fun just getting used to your Bible? Ezekiel chapter 20. Look at verse 30 and 31. Wherefore say unto the house, remember Ezekiel prophesied during the Babylonian captivity, and it says, Wherefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Are ye polluted after the manner of your fathers, and commit ye whoredom or harlotry after their, what? Abominations. For when you offer your gifts, when you make your sons to pass through the fire, you pollute yourselves with all your idols even unto this day. And shall I be inquired of by you, O house of Israel? As I live, saith the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. Abominations. Now go to Revelation 18 and look at verse 5 and 6. Revelation 18, 5 and 6. For her sins, the Bible says, have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double, according to her works, in the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. What that basically is saying, as we will look at when we get to chapter 18, is we're going to see a judgment uh, double in intensity and and um, extent, uh, double of everything that she has done. Uh, God's really going to bring his revenge on this woman. But again, that cup full of abominations. So whoever the woman is, we've learned so far that she has covered all nations of the world, especially affects all the kings of the earth and the economic systems of the world. Uh, she is very wealthy. Uh, she has great position and authority and influence. And the truth is that the cup that she holds out to all the nations of the world is full of abominations. If you get involved with her, it leads to idolatry and immorality. Now, isn't that interesting? So we got to keep thinking, who is this woman? Now let's come to Revelation 17, verse 5. 
By the way, there's something very interesting to me. I, I was walking through the Vatican, um, admiring its great treasures, and uh, there was a young man, a priest, a very knowledgeable man, who was taking us through this tour. And we came upon this gigantic uh, tapestry, which was of the woman of Revelation 17 with the golden cup in her right hand and a cross in her left hand, sitting on the beast with seven heads and ten horns on head number seven, which correctly pictures what's in Revelation. And the bottom caption under this was the mother church. And I asked the guide, I said, um, you know, doesn't it bother you that that tapestry up there uh, is picturing the woman in Revelation 17 and you're calling it the mother church? He said, no, not at all. He said, um, a few Protestants have wrongly interpreted that. I said, well, I mean, whether you're Protestant or Catholic or Jewish or whatever, if you just read it, it doesn't sound too favorable to me. I mean, uh, but he reminded me of something that we're not saying this in order to uh, draw some hard and fast conclusions, but just to show you how confused people can get. He reminded me that in 1825 A.D., Pope Leo XII struck a medal with his image on one side, and on the other side of the medal was the woman with the golden cup in her right hand representing the Roman church. And that has continued to be the symbol of the Roman church, the woman with the golden cup in her hand. Um, it makes you wonder about how they're reading the Bible. I, I don't understand it. Uh, go to verse 5 of Revelation 17. We've looked at the announcement of judgment, the authority of the woman, the appearance of the woman, but now the association of the woman with Babylon. Upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. There are really two things that are said there. One, that she is a mystery. Now, the word mystery appears 22 times, and interestingly, four times in the book of Revelation. Twice in this chapter, Revelation 17. She's a mystery. It's not mysterious, like God's trying to hide it from you, but uh, a mystery was concealed at a certain period of time and then unfolded at another period of time. And apparently the mystery about all this is being unveiled for us here in Revelation 17 and 18. But she's called a mystery. A mystery that is associated with ancient Babylon or Babylon the Great. She's not only a mystery, she's also a mother. So be careful what you conclude. Whatever this woman is, she's a mother, according to verse 5, of harlots and abominations. Uh, she's the one who's been uh, initiating it and perpetuating it, but there are many other forms, obviously, that flow off of it. But she's the mother of it all. Now we're told that she's... Um, she has in her forehead this name, Mystery Babylon the Great. And everybody wants to, uh, you know, back up and take a look at Babylon, and rightly so. The word Babylon is mentioned about 286 times in the King James Version of the Bible. Uh, you have also the story of the beginnings of Babylon when it's called Babel um, in the book of Genesis. And I'd like you to turn there now, Genesis chapter 10. As we look at the beginnings of Babel or Babylon, Genesis chapter 10. In verse 8, it says, Cush, who is the son of Ham, grandson of Noah. Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Now, that can look positive, but you can also translate the Hebrew against. It's, it's a matter of interpretation, but I think what is said is not complimenting the man, but it's stating his rebellion, as you'll see in a moment. He's a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it's said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Eric, and Akkad, and Kalna, 
in the land of Shinar. And out of that land went forth Asher and builded Nineveh. So the Assyrian Empire came out of this uh, uh, first empire. Now God had told the people to uh, split up. Uh, back in chapter 9 of Genesis, verse 1, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Uh, he wanted them to divide up, according to chapter 10, into all kinds of nations, tribes, tongues, and people. But the story of Babel, and Nimrod as the founder, is how they are directly disobeying the plan of God to distribute all over the face of the world. Uh, instead, they want to bring everybody together. And so the beginnings of what we today call new world order, the beginnings of world government and world economy and world religion, it was all here back in Genesis chapter 10, the foundation of Babylon itself. Now some writers will tell you that Babel uh, means gate of God. Uh, Bab, gate, El, God, gate of God. Uh, but before I came tonight, I decided to uh, just take a little trip into the Hebrew again to make sure I understand it, and uh, even consulted the Encyclopedia Judaica and uh, looked at several Jewish sources. And without question, they all indicate the meaning of the name is confusion, which is exactly what God did. He confused uh, their speech, as you know. But look at chapter 11. Let's get into the story, and maybe we can learn something. Now, Babylon is on the eastern bank of the Euphrates. Uh, the old Babylon's about 20 miles south of Baghdad. Chapter 11, the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Now, I don't know, do, do interesting details interest you? I set you up for that. How do you know they're interesting? But anyway, uh, this one is interesting to me. I, I was in the Oriental Museum in Chicago several years ago and in the Sumerian room. Now, um, some of you with gray hairs might have gone to school and learned that the first uh, world empire was Egypt, um, the first culture and all of that. And then there was uh, um, Assyria and Babylon and so forth. But we have a culture before Egypt. If you go to Egypt today and listen to their guides, they will tell you they're the oldest civilization and culture in the world. But there is an older civilization and culture, certainly not a world empire, but an older civilization and culture. And that's what we call the Sumerian culture, S-U-M-E-R-I-A-N. And it's located between the Tigris and Euphrates River in what is today Iraq, and it is the Mesopotamian Valley. And you remember in the Persian Gulf War, you heard Saddam Hussein mention that they are the oldest civilization in the world. Well, he's actually correct. That's where the Garden of Eden would have been located. Um, last I heard, there's no sign and church built over the spot. But uh, it's somewhere there. But as I was in this Sumerian room, and they have a lot of artifacts from this period of time, a lot of interesting things, because Abraham, you remember, came out of the Sumerian culture at Ur of Chaldees. So there's a lot of interesting things. But they had some mythological literature from this period of time. From the third dynasty of Ur, um, there's a document that I found very interesting. It says that all the people at one time spoke one language. Well, that's a very interesting detail. Uh, it, it, it's mythological because it says, until Enki, E-N-K-I, who was a Sumerian god of wisdom, confounded their speech. You know what I find is in mythological literature, though corrupted, we have evidence of the truthfulness and accuracy of the Bible. Uh, very interesting to me that the whole story of the Tower of Babel is indicated in Sumerian literature uh, that we find from that period of time. It, it, to me, it's fascinating. It's kind of like the story of the flood. You say, do you really believe the flood happened? Well, the flood is in 40 pagan cultures and documents a flood story with a man and his family being safe in a boat. So I would say in 40 different ancient cultures recording the flood story, there's a possibility it might have happened. <laughs> you understand? These are what I call fascinating details. They're not, you know, overwhelming evidence. But, but I thought that was very interesting. Now we're reading it here. The whole earth was of one language and one speech. So don't fight it. It's true. It came to pass, and people say, well, what language was it? 
Well, if you're Jewish, it was Hebrew, okay? But I was in a conference uh, in which they brought some Hispanic pastors up from uh, Latin America uh, up to Anaheim Convention Center a few years ago. I was one of the speakers, and I was sitting on the platform, and um, I speak a little Spanish, actually very little, but I can understand it if they go slow enough. And I'm on the platform, and a man who's speaking is speaking in Spanish. And so they gave me an interpreter who sat right by me, but he had a very loud voice. And he kept talking in my ear, and I'm trying to hear the guy, trying to follow that and listening to him. So I, I finally stopped him, and I said, you know, I can pick it up a little bit, and I, you know, if you don't mind, I'd just like to listen to the speaker. He went, oh, oh, oh that is wonderful. I said, what? I'm just saying I want to listen to the speaker. Oh, oh, oh. That is wonderful. You can understand a little bit of what he says? I said, yes, a little bit. Well, then you will enjoy heaven. <laughs> ah. He was absolutely convinced that uh, Spanish was going to be spoken in heaven, that it was the most beautiful language in the world. But uh, anyway... Uh, <laughs> C. <laughs> okay. Verse 2. It came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. Again, I don't want to bore you with details, but this is the only thing it could be in a Mesopotamian valley and is totally different from the building materials that are used in the land of Israel in ancient times. It's just a small point, but I love it. <laughs> God's word is accurate. They said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven and let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. Now that is of interest to me also. Little things again. But in Babylonian Chronicles, a document from archaeological discovery, the Babylonian Chronicles, I read a passage that I thought was interesting. The Babylonians believed that the Tower of Babel was built by the gods. And I just thought it was interesting that God made it clear here in verse 5. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built it. No, it wasn't the gods. It was the children of men built it. Just an interesting little detail. Verse 6. The Lord said, Behold, the people are one. They have all one language. And this they began to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down. The plural here is fascinating, is it not? As a relates to the Lord Yahweh let us go down and there confound their language Babylon means confusion Babel rather let's confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech so the Lord scattered them abroad from there upon the face of all the earth and they left off to build the city therefore is the name of it called Babel because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from there did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Now, folks, out in the Mesopotamian Valley in Iraq, archaeological discovery has found many so-called ziggurats, temples, that are, um, as they're getting higher or getting smaller at the top, uh, different levels, and they found the ruins of many of them. As a matter of fact, at ancient Babylon, uh, they have found what's called uh, uh, Esagila, or the Temple of Marduk, which was in ancient Babylon, and they actually believe this is the Tower of Babel. Many reasons for it, because in Babylonian language, it's called e Temen Anki, which means House of the Foundations of Heaven and Earth. It's, it's estimated, uh, the remains of it give the archaeological uh, experts evidence of how tall it was. It was 300 feet high. It had two sanctuaries, one at the base and one at the top. And uh, most of those who have studied this believe this was the Tower of Babel. Uh, it was uh, redone, reconstructed, 
uh, refurbished, renovated on several occasions by different dynasties, but they believe this is the evidence of it. Now, this whole story of the beginning of Babel is very interesting. Nimrod is, according to the Bible, the founder of this empire of which the first city is Babylon. Now, the woman is called Mystery Babylon the Great. Nimrod's wife, we know a great deal about her, Semiramis. Semiramis I. Now, in Babylonian literature, she has a husband named Ninus, who we believe is Nimrod. She was the first high priestess of the Babylonian mystery religion. She claimed to have a son by miraculous conception whose name is Tammuz. Tammuz is mentioned in the Bible in Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 14. Interestingly, he was also known as Bacchus, the god of wine. Another interesting thing to me is that his name was constantly uh, pictured and symbolized by the ancient uh, Babylonians by the sign of the cross, which was really the letter Tau, T-A-U, uh, the first letter of the name Tammuz, the sign of the cross. Uh, this woman, uh, Semiramis I, the first high priest of the Babylonian mystery religion, is also the same as the queen of heaven, which is mentioned in Jeremiah 7, verse 18, and chapter 44, verses 15 to 30. She claimed to have a son, Tammuz, who was born in miraculous fashion, as I said, and would be the promised deliverer. One of the interesting things is that her husband is also the son. This is very fascinating because in all the mother-child religion developments of the ancient world, this was always true. Whenever you see uh, the Madonna and child, the mother and the child, the child was also the husband as well as the son. It was considered to be a miraculous conception and uh, you'll find this everywhere. The queen of heaven with a baby in her arms. Uh, in the Phoenician culture, it is Ashtoreth and Tammuz. In the Egyptian culture, it is Isis and Osiris, or also known as Horus. In India, it is Issi and Iswara. In Greek uh, backgrounds, it is Aphrodite and Eros. In the Italian culture of Rome, it was Venus and Cupid. In Asia, it's Sibeli and uh, Dioeus. Uh, it goes on and on. In every ancient culture and religion, we have the mother child. We have also a lot of mysteries in these religious systems that date all the way from Babylon the Great. You have, for instance, a lot of customs that you practice now that are Babylonian. I'm not making it up. If you think I am, um, study it for yourself. There's plenty of evidence. Uh, for instance, Christmas. Oh, please, David, don't ruin Christmas, of all things. Well, first of all, Christmas to me is the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, and I don't care when it was. But everybody knows that December 25th is a celebration of an ancient Babylonian custom called Yule Day. You know, the Yule log? The word Yule is simply the Chaldean word for infant. The Chaldeans are the priestly sect of the ancient Babylonians. Uh, I hate to ruin Easter for you, too. But Easter's from the Babylonian Ishtar. Uh, the, the, the tradition in many American homes is to fix hot cross buns uh, on Good Friday and dyed eggs on Easter Sunday. I hate to disappoint you. Those are all Chaldean rites from the ancient Babylonian religion. I could ruin a lot of holidays. You want me to? No, no, let's don't do that. To a Christian, Christmas is the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, and even in a pagan environment, we can preach Christ. Uh, to a Christian, Easter is Resurrection Day, and frankly, every Sunday to us is a celebration of it. But it is interesting as you follow it all the way through. The Babylonian religious system, after the fall of Babylon, moved during the days of the Persian Empire to new headquarters. Interestingly, at a city that's mentioned in the book of Revelation, and that's the city of Pergamos, where the Bible says Satan's throne is. Yes, the Babylonian religion, with its priestly system, confessing to a priest your sins, all of it, friends, 
It's all a part of Babylonian religion. The College of Cardinals, Pontifex Maximus, Supreme Pontiff, all Babylonian religion terms, every last one of them. It moved to Pergamus. From Pergamus, it came into Italy through the Etruscans, who were very deep into Babylonian religion. You probably know one of the famous Etruscans. His name was Julius Caesar, who, by the way, was the high priest of the Babylonian religion, who, by the way, is the one who took the title Pontifex Maximus, and that's where Octavian got it, who became Augustus Caesar and was the first one to take the title Supreme Pontiff, which all Roman Empire uh, emperors took from then on. From the time of the empire, beginning in 30 B.C., uh, clear uh, to the fall of Rome. When Rome fell in 476 A.D., I find it very interesting who took over. The Visigoths came into Rome, sacked the city. Rome had fallen, uh, perhaps in terms of its power, long before, but its official death was 476 A.D. And uh, interesting to me that the bishop of Rome at the time, who had been gaining quite a bit of ascendancy in the last couple hundred years previous to that, the bishop of Rome was a man named Damasus. And Damasus all of a sudden took the title Pontifex Maximus, Supreme Pontiff, and it wasn't until 1870 that the Roman church said, the Pope is infallible. But all these years they've been speaking of his greatness, the vicar of Christ on the earth. Damasus was from the Carmelite monastery in Haifa, Israel, which is well known to be perpetuators of the ancient Babylonian religion. Now it is in Rome, and now everybody um, that is religious is taking over all the political involvements of the Roman Empire, so much so that Philip Schaff, the historian, said the Roman Catholic Church is nothing but pagan Rome baptized. Folks, I don't wish any evil on the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church teaches all of this and will tell you all of it. The sad thing is that we have adapted and adopted all that paganism was, and it's everywhere. Oh, it's not just Catholics. It's Protestants, too. We're all a part of it. We go along with it. We don't even know how much is in our culture at the present time that is related to ancient Babylonian religion. It's sometimes hard to even teach the Bible uh, in its purity and its simplicity because uh, sure as shooting, you get on something like this and it's going to make people offended because they're, they're going to see that, wait a minute, that's something we do. That's something we believe in. Religious symbols that we use that are in our Christian bookstores and all over our artifacts, so to speak. You can date all of the, you can even show all of those symbols in ancient Babylonian religious systems. It's kind of hard, folks, to identify what we read in the Bible with what's happening in our Christian world. People ask me, well, is, is the harlot, the, uh, uh, is that uh, the Roman Catholic Church? Well, they certainly are a part of it. But aren't the Protestants also involved? Are not we also corrupt? Are not we also experiencing the tragedies of the Babylonian religion that has infected every ancient culture of the world, affected the Roman Empire, and affected all of church history to the point we are Babylonians. We are following much of what they say. And we, we don't even want to hear anybody attack it. We don't want to hear anybody expose it. We just don't want to listen to it. And the purity of God's word, especially as it relates to the nation of Israel and God's plan for it, somehow is lost as churches start talking about themselves being the new Israel. There's all kinds of problems related to this. But these names are in the Bible. Bel, the top of the Babylonian pantheon. You know him perhaps as Baal or Baal in the Israelite religion. In Jeremiah 1-2 it says, Bel is confounded. You do know that Cush is the father of Nimrod also known as Merodach in Babylonian religion. All of this is, is, is something that's well known. Mentioned in the Bible, Jeremiah 50, verse 2. Bells in Isaiah 46, Jeremiah 50, chapter 51. Tammuz, Ezekiel 8, 14. Queen of heaven, Jeremiah 7, Jeremiah 44. It's almost like Christians are stunned to hear this when it's right in our Bibles. God has warned us about that system of religion 
the Babylonian religion, the Chaldee priesthood. He's warned us and warned us. He warned the children of Israel about all these abominations. And yet today, it has infiltrated every, every part of what we know as Christendom around the world. Babylonian religion. So, who is the woman? Well, you have to come back next week. <laughs> but go back to Revelation chapter 17, verse 6 for a moment. Sometimes we're too quick to judge. But all of this is certainly important to our understanding because she is the mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. But look at one final thing, the accusation against her. And this again is another clue. Verse 6, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration, or it's a play on the word, wonder again. Go back to chapter 6, verse 10. When the fifth seal judgment was introduced, the opening of the fifth seal, it says in verse 9, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood? on them that dwell on the earth. Keep that in mind. Go to chapter 16, verse 5 and 6. Looking at the seven last plagues and plague number three, the third bowl of wrath that was poured on the rivers and fountains of waters, they became blood. And the angel of the waters said, verse 5, Revelation 16, Thou art righteous, O Lord, who art and wast and shalt be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink. They are worthy. They deserve this. Chapter 18, verse 24. Concerning the destruction of this woman, Babylon the Great, it says, In her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Wow. The martyrs cried out, How long, O Lord, till you avenge our blood? The angel of the water says, they've shed the blood of saints and prophets. They deserve to drink blood themselves. God destroy them. And then at the fall of this woman, it says, in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints. So I say to you that whoever this woman is, this mother of harlots and abominations, she is the primary guilty party in the death of God's people who have stood for his word and the testimony of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whoever the woman is, she is the one who has been killing and destroying God's people all the way through the centuries. So who is the woman? See you next week. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, when we look throughout history, we see lessons that some of us don't want to hear or think about. We see very clearly the evidence of Babylonian religion infiltrating religious system after religious system in the nations of the world. It got into Israel and you brought judgment on them because they had participated in all these abominations of those nations that have followed in Babylon's line, and it's still with us today. It's so much a part of us that we can't even recognize those things that we do and believe in and practice that are a part of it and not really of your word. Lord, I sense a great burden for those who may be new to the Word of God. It all sounds so weird and strange. And yet, Lord, we know that the evidence is powerful, overwhelming. 
And you said in your word in chapter 18 to come out of her, my people. Don't participate in her sins. So, Lord, apparently some of your people who love you are a part of it and need to get out of it. It's so easy to be locked into religious practice and trappings and to be so far away from the simplicity of the gospel. It's so easy to go along with everything and to be a part of it. And the church becomes somewhat like a club we join. And yet our hearts are far from the Lord. You warned the religious leaders of the past that they follow the traditions of men rather than the commandment of the word of God. You warned them that their hearts were far from you. They were hypocrites. But they felt they were righteous and godly. Lord, help us not to be deceived. Help us, Lord, to know personally the living God through his son, Jesus Christ. Where we can really be set free. For the truth will make us free. Thank you, Lord. And I pray for those that are here listening right now are not really sure that if they died today, they'd be in heaven with Christ. Are not really sure that they would be ready if Jesus would come. Lord, I just pray that you'd move in their hearts, convict them by your Holy Spirit, and draw them to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Redeemer that will come and take away our sin, the one who will come and establish his kingdom on earth. God, we thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.